Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Laura's going to start recording now. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and we will start looking at Digimap School. Right, I'm assuming that everybody can see Digimap for Schools now. We can see a world map. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the chat, so if, if somebody can't see that and can see something that they didn't expect, I'm expecting somebody will let me know. All right, Laura, Laura's not waving frantically at me, so I'm assuming it's all okay. So I'm going to start by saying that um, Digimap for Schools offers a whole range of maps at lots and lots of different scales. We have maps from Audience Survey primarily. Um, they cover uh, Great Britain. We also have maps from the rest of the world, from HarperCollins, which is the sort of standard um, Atlas style maps, and uh, you, you probably recognise a lot of those. We also have maps from an organisation called Natural Earth, um, which covers uh, a global um, uh, global uh, range rather than just the, the UK. Um, we've also got aerial photography that comes from a company called Get Mapping, and we have historical maps that come from the National Library of Scotland. So some of these are only available for Great Britain and some of them are very available globally. So if you sometimes find a blank map or you come across a blank map, try zooming in and out massively and you might find that something reappears. Um, we're going to start by doing a search. So the easy way to, to, to search for a place is to type it into the search box in the top right hand corner here. So let's search for, uh, let's search for London because it's an obvious one. In this search box, we have lots of different things. Um, it's based on a, a pre-built database of, of place names and so on. So you'll find that the results are split into places in the UK and places in the world. But we also have global landmarks. And sometimes you will see roads in there too if you're searching within the UK. So let's just click on the Tower of London because it's an obvious one. What it will do is give you um, a, a Uh, or um, the uh, hang on a second, I've got things in the way up here. Um, I don't want to start you, video because I don't want to to. Can we turn the microphone off, please? Thank you. Um, there's a zoom in and out bar here, so we can zoom in and out. If you're looking at the UK, you'll see that as you zoom in and out, the maps will change. So, I wouldn't survey produce a range of different maps appropriate for different scales. So, lots of these you you'll recognise, of course. And as you zoom in, the map will change bit by bit and to, as, as the scale changes. If you're using an iPad or a touch screen, then either double tapping or using a pinch zoom will also work to, to change the scale of the maps. As we go further in, you'll see that we get to the Explorer maps. This is the equivalent to the orange paper, sorry, the, the paper maps that have orange covers that OS called the Explorer ones. And as you zoom out again here, you'll get the uh, the, the Land Ranger ones, which are the pink ones. We know them as pink maps and orange maps. And as we go further in, eventually you'll get to the very, very detailed data, which is the OS master map data. This is Audience Survey's master topographic database. So this is the most detailed stuff you'll get for anywhere in the UK. And as you can see, we can go right into the Tower of London and you can see all the edges of the grass and the pavements and all the steps and so on. It's very, very detailed. And you'll find that that's quite fascinating when looking at places that you know, and sometimes working out whether it's right or not. Um, the different maps available are, as I say, UK wide like this, and as you get further out on the global scale, I'll just keep zooming out here, you can see that they change yet again. A little handy hint here is this button just underneath the zoom bar will zoom to your maximum extent. So we're often asked how to produce a a hot map of the whole world. This is really hard to do given the data that we've got and the scale that the data originates at. So we'll, sh we'll show you in a bit how to find pre-built maps that are global maps. They come in our learning resources section. So search function is up in the top right hand corner here. Let's try zooming into the UK first and we'll try a different search. Let's clear this search here. So you can clear the search by clicking the cross and then just wiping the text out like that. Work. Um, let's try um, Edinburgh just for another place. And you can see how we've got places in the UK, but we've also got places in the world. This is always interesting to see how many Edinburghs there are in the world. Um, 
lots. Oh, why is it searching for alumni? That's not meant to happen. <gasps> Trials and tribulations of a live demonstration. <laughs> Let's try Edinburgh again. There we go. So I can click on all these places here. And as you can see, it's got Edinburgh College, but it's Edinburgh Furs. There are lots of different options. So if you are um, looking for a particular place, sometimes it's sensible to zoom into roughly the right area and then do a search to see what, see what you can come up with. The results, as I said, are split into places and world places. And the map will zoom to the location here. Your pin here is temporary. So as you remove the search term like this, you find that the pin disappears. So let's do a bit of navigation. The easy thing to do is to click and hold and drag the map around, very straightforward. Um, if you're using a touch screen, again, with a finger, you can just drag, drag the map around. Double tap to zoom in or use your scroll wheel to zoom out and in and out and in and out until you find roughly the map that you're looking for. As I said, the maps will change according to the scale so that you always get a map that's appropriate for the scale you're looking at. Um, well, let's come to the left hand panel here. Key factors here are there's a drawing tools uh, section, we've got a map key, we have a save maps function, which is like a map chest, if you like, or a set of bookmarks. We have a series of overlays and we have a series of measurement tools. You can add your own data to it. You can also search a range of photographs. These come from the Geograph database. There's also a map information panel at the very bottom, which is really useful for working out which the OS map product is, um, the date that the product was created, um, the scale and the projection and lots of other information there. The other thing I want to introduce you to is this map selector here. So there's a slider here that goes between left and right. And these are the, this is the full range of maps that we have available. So the radio button on this side where the transparency slider is right over to the right, will show you the map that you're looking at at the moment. So there's the aerial maps. The aerial X maps have um, roads and text labels written over the top of the aerial photography. We have 1950s maps and we have the 1890s maps too. Not all the maps are available at all scales. So as you zoom out on the, um, the historical ones, eventually you'll find that they disappear into the contemporary maps because we can't display the historical maps at zoom, very zoomed out scales. As we zoom in, you'll find that the historical maps come back again. So if you choose Um, and choose the aerial photography. It takes a little bit of time to load because the aerial photography is very large. And as we fade between the aerial photography and the modern maps, you can start to see how things change. So in places where there have been lots of new houses built, this can be really interesting to see how towns and cities have developed over time. Let's look at um, somewhere like uh, so let me just have a look at Dalkeith, Keith. I happen to know that that one has expanded quite a lot in recent years. So if we look at the 1890s map of Dalkeith Keith here, and zoom in a little bit, you can see where the town sits. But if we now fade between that and the contemporary Ordnance Survey map, you can see how much of the, the, the new building is going on up in this um, eastern side. So it's quite interesting to have a look and see how places have um, changed over time. If you can switch between the two like that. Lots of fields, lots of houses, lots of fields, lots of houses. Very, very useful to, to check out um, as well the 1950s one, which is a slightly smaller scale. You just see that one there. Um, these have a, a more limited uh, scale range because they're, they're, um, they're harder to see at very small scales, very large scales rather, when they, they get um, less detailed. Let me show you the drawing tools next. So this is useful to add um, your own information to the map. So for example, we might want to try and add some markers to a space in the park. The drawing tools is the top button on the left hand side here and we have markers here so you can add a marker to say where particular things are. 
you could maybe mark where um, children's houses are and see how far they walk to school. So let's, let's pick some arbitrary points here. Um, there's a school here. Um, let's mark some houses here and you could, might be able to get children to mark their own houses on here and then work out who's closest to school. There are lots of different markers. So you could have crosses, you could have um, diamonds and squares and stars. The tree is an absolute favourite. Put lots of trees in a space like that. Um, and we've added some smiley faces if you want to go down, go down one. If you want to draw shapes, the shape marker is here. You can either draw a free form polygon like this. So you click once for each vertex and then double click to finish. You can also change the settings on this. So you can change, select the polygon I've got for clicking the select button. And then I can change the colors and the fill settings to create a different color. My polygons also have a freehand one. This one's quite clever. We can just draw with your finger um, a random shape, but you can also draw a regular shape like triangles and squares, rectangles, pentagons, and so on. Um, I'm going to delete all those just now by using the delete function here. Click the delete all and it just will delete all drawings. If you click the delete all drawings, it will delete everything that you've added to your map, regardless of whether you can see it or not. It doesn't have to be just the things that you see on on the map in front of you, if you've drawn function, uh, drawn things elsewhere and then moved your map around, it will delete everything that's on the map, even if you can't see it. If you want to delete particular things, there is a delete on click button down here. I draw another couple of functions. Um, we can see there's a delete on click here, which means I could delete just one of them rather than all of them. I can draw lines, fairly standard stuff. Um, click at each vertex and then double click to finish. That doesn't measure the line, but once I've drawn my line, I can use this measure tool and click on the line that I've drawn and it will add a measure. I'm going to distract for a minute and go on to the measurement tool here because there's often some confusion between this. The drawing tools leave annotations on your map permanently or as long as you leave them there. The measurement tools are effectively a temporary tool just to measure whatever it is that you're looking at on the map. They will not come out if you print them and they won't stay beyond the use of those tools there. So if I wanted to measure the distance from this roundabout to this roundabout, I can click the distance measurement here, click once, and then I can measure along the road just by clicking and then double click to finish it. And as you can see, I get a little tooltip here. It gives me the distance that my line has traveled. In the same way, I can use the area measurement. Let's say I wanted to measure the area of this industrial estate, click on the area measurement and then I just use the mouse to click around the edge of the area that I want to measure. And then I can just do a double click to finish and it will tell me the area in meter squared. In the left hand panel, it will give you both a meter squared um, measurement and an acres and the same with the distance. So if I did a, a distance measurement, it will give me both the distance in meters and in yards. If I delete all the measurements now, that just gets rid of all those things. If you want to print marks like that and print um, distances measured on the map, the best option is to use the, uh, the line and the measurement tool there because those will definitely come out on your print one. You can also add text boxes. So if I wanted to add a label to this to say, here is my tree, I can just type into that box. I can then move that around if I click it right. To change it you can see that the tree will highlight in yellow that's because i've got the tree marked here i can also add a free text label so let's put one next to it saying car park and click ok and you'll find that the text comes up there can you see that the select button here is highlighted if i click on my text now i can both change the text color and the text font and the text size and it will change that. And then I click anywhere to unhighlight it again. I can also add my own images to the map. So I click on the image button, choose my file from, uh, let's see if I've got a random picture on my desktop. Let's try that one and upload it. And you can see the picture will appear. I can then move that around to fit with whatever else I want to see on my map. Um, 
last couple of tools to show you here is the grid reference tool. If I click somewhere like this, I can get a grid reference here. So it uses the marker setting that I've already got here. I happen to have the tree, so if I want to change that to the little pin drop, I can go back to my grid reference tool and I can pick any grid reference, any, any point it will give me a grid reference like this. The grid reference, the size of the grid reference you get is dependent upon the scale of the map you look at. So if I zoom right out, like this, go even further. I'm afraid, I'm really sorry. It's taking a while to load. If I select my grid reference marker again, and I pick the grid reference for, say, Glasgow, you can see the grid reference is very short. That's because at this scale, there's no point in me trying to um, find a six figure grid reference because at this scale, I can't identify that accurately. Once you've set the grid reference there, it doesn't change. It will continue to stay uh, as it is set at the scale at which you set it. However, this does enable you to see how more accurate you can be with a larger scale map, which is always very useful. You can see how accurately they manage to pinpoint their house when they're looking at a scale map of a map of the UK rather than just just a, a local town. You'll also notice in the map information panel here that there is an option to capture the coordinates of your cursor here. As I move the cursor around, you can see that the um, the location and the grid reference of the cursor changes. So back to there. Let me just clean my map up again. I'm going to delete all those drawings again. Let's go back over here. The other thing to show you is um, the buffer tool. So this one's quite useful. So I'm going to zoom out for this one. It's maybe a bit easier. If I want to measure how many railway stations there are within a certain distance of a particular point, I can click on this buffer tool here. I'm going to do a point buffer. So it's going to draw a circle around my point. Let's say um, I want a radius of 10 miles. So I set the settings up like this from my point in the middle of Dalkey. So then it will draw my circle. Now my circle is huge. So I'm going to just zoom out a little bit. And from that, I will be able to count how many railway stations I find within that circle. You can also do a line buffer instead. So if you had a line, um, let's, let's do, uh, let's do something a bit more simpler. So if I'm going to choose a line buffer, and let's say I want to, um, to know how much land lies within, say, one mile of the A1 between this point and this point, I draw my line, double click to finish, and it will give me a buffer that shows me the zone that's in, within one mile of my um, of the line that I've drawn. Quite useful for, for various functions. Are we okay for questions, Laura? Hi, uh, yes, I've got here um, some questions. Uh, just bear with me, I'm just gonna uh, maximize the chat here. So one of the questions, so uh, Michaela asked, how up to date are the maps? For instance, we are a school that's only six years old. So will that be on the OS map? It, it should be, yes. So the, um, the Ordnance Survey have a um, policy that updates particular features first. So large new housing estates tend to come high, high up the priority new motorways, really big stuff that impacts lots of people, that usually is quite high on the priority list and that should come through to the data very, very quickly. If somebody adds a conservatory to their house, it may not filter through into the, the master database for quite a long time. So it's all about relative stuff. If you're a school that's six years old, I would think you're almost certainly in there. If you are not, you can report it directly to OS and they will add it. And if anybody wants the links to do that, we'll, we'll dig them out and send them on. Um, we do get quite a lot of calls from people saying, my new garage is not on the map. <laughs> like, well, um, the impact of having a new garage is probably limited to very few people. And in terms of OS's priorities in updating the map of the whole country, somebody's new garage isn't top priority compared to a, a new extension to the M6, say. So uh, these things are all relative. 
Thank you, Emma. Uh, we've got another question from Sophia. With the historical maps, is it possible to put two maps from different periods side to side in order to compare them easily? Um, not really, because we only have two. Um, it is up to a point. Let's go back to the historical maps and I'll show you. Let me just delete all these um, drawings because I find them quite distracting. Let's have a look at the historical maps that we do have. The best thing you can do with historical maps is to choose the one on one side of this map selector drop down and one on the other. So the two sets of historical maps we have are the 1950s and the 1890s. So let's put one on each side and then you can slide between them. So you can't put them side by side to compare them, but you can slide between them to see what the changes are as, as you go. Um, adding a two up function is something that we have considered. It's on, it's on, uh, on our radar for sure. Um, we haven't yet managed to implement it, but it's definitely something we are considering. Um, if that's something you'd really like to see, then wave your hand at us and, and we'll up the, up the priority a bit if we can. Thank you so much. Oh, so one, one more thing on the, the dates of the maps. Um, if you want to know the date of any particular map, this map information panel on the bottom of the left hand side will give you the map date here. So this one says 1950s. But as I zoom right in, let's go back to the audience survey one, which is the contemporary one. And I need to put my slider in the right place. Um, this will tell you that this map is November 2019. As you zoom out to a slightly different map, you'll see that th this one is more up to date, October 2020, and the one before that is June 2021. So OS update their maps on a on kind of regular schedules, but each map product um, is done on a different timescale. So some are updated more frequently than others, and uh, some of them are a considerable amount of effort for us to process and put in place. So the very detailed stuff is um, is November 2019, because for us to take the most up to date version from OS and to process it and produce it like this for you guys to easily interact with is a mammoth effort. So we don't we don't do that particularly often. There is a new update to this on the way, though. So I think when it comes out, the latest version will be 20, November 2021. OK, if you save a map, you, you take it as a, at a snapshot in time. So we'll look at the save maps here. Shall I cover the save maps next, Laura? Is that is that good? Yeah, OK, so if you've got a, um, a map that you've added some annotations to and you want to save it, the simple thing to do is to hit the save map section here on the left hand side. There is your map that you want to save and you can just hit save map and then you can add a map title to it. Um, you can add your class name and you can add a pupil name. We try to discourage children from adding pupil names for GDPR reasons because it is personal data and so on, but we understand that we can't control what people add to the, to the information here. Um, but to add something that makes it identifiable as that person's map is, is really useful. So maybe they have student numbers and they enter their student number or a nickname or something like that. It's entirely up to, up to them. So once I hit the save button, you'll see that my map appears in here. So there's some maps that um, my colleagues have made here in the past. So we'll just have a quick look at some of these and I can replace the drawings on those to get a new map. But my original map that I just saved will always be there. And I click on it again and it comes back to where it was. Okay. You can organize the saved map. So if you are a, a teacher, you, there's a pin code unlock the, the, the map um, folder structure here so that you can edit it. But it's not sensible to allow, say, very small children to rearrange the maps in the different folders. So there's a pin on it, so it's locked. So you could maybe set up a folder for your class and then you keep control of that. We can give any, anybody the pin number for their accounts if they, if they want it. All you need to do is just give us a call if, if you don't already have it. That's the save maps. Let me move on to the overlays. I've realized I'm, I'm going a bit slow, we've got quite a bit to cover. Um, the overlays here are a relatively new function for us. So we've got a series of overlays that will just sit on top of the map that you've got here.
zoom in a bit, you can see, oh, there we go. Sorry, my connection is being very slow, which is why they're taking time to draw. So this grid will change according to the scale of the map that you're, um, you're looking at in and out. So the, zoom, the more you zoom in, the, um, the larger, the, the smaller the squares become. Some of the maps already have those grid lines on them, of course, like the, the Land Ranger ones and the Explorer ones. We've still added the grid over the top as well. As you get into the very detailed data, very detailed maps, you can see that the grid is overlaid on top. And from this, you can start to look at um, teaching grid references and so on. We've also got um, some colouring in. We call these colouring in because actually what we do is wipe out the symbolising for all the maps and allow children to create their own maps from, from the shapes that appear, appear there. We've also got a postcodes overlay. This one is interesting because it depends what scale you look at it and how big the postcode areas are. These will appear as purple lines, as you can see there. And as you zoom out, you can change the transparency on them a little bit too. So if they're too bold, you can cut them down again. And if we look in and let's try a slightly more built up area there, you can see that the postcode area appears. And the more you zoom in, the smaller the postcode unit becomes. So postcode units cover about 15 different address spaces, uh, address, um, address points. And here you can see who would fall into each individual postcode. Those um, overlays are specific to Great Britain. They don't apply overseas, obviously, not um, everywhere overseas has postcodes. Um, but we've also got world climate overlays. So these are a series of, um, oh, let me just turn postcodes off again. It gets confusing. If we zoom out a bit to a global level, we can see that we've got some average temperatures between particular dates, which enables you to see how these might change. So we've got average temperature in 1970 to 2000, but then the next one is 2010 to 2018. So we've just taken the data that's available, appreciating that there are some gaps in the, in the timeline there. This is simply what's, what's been available to us um, and readily um, easy to process. But including, uh, uh, sorry, over and above the temperature, we've also got um, precipitation and projected precipitation and projected temperatures, which is also very interesting. In terms of world human geography, we have a population density map. This is one of my absolute favourites. To add this, this one, let me just take the temperature off. Population density. My map is not refreshing very quickly. There we go. Population density is fascinating. So this gives you the population per square kilometre, number of people per square kilometre. And from it, you get a fantastic overview of where the world's population really sits. There are some gaps. So here in, um, in Africa, there's a section where we just don't have any data. The data doesn't, doesn't exist. There's another small patch in um, South America, I think, here, which I think is Suriname. Um, there's no data for that either. But as an overlay to see where the, the greatest numbers of people reside, and then to start to think about why they might reside there. So what, what is it that causes such a dense population here in northern India? There's lots and lots of interesting discussions to be had about why people settle where they do and what other factors are involved in, in their decisions, and how much is historical and so on. Um, we've also got the world time zones. So there's interesting stuff to be done here about um, how, how the world moves around and how um, countries line up with other countries in terms of their time zones. Um, in terms of world physical geography, we've got the world biomes. This is an interesting one because um, I want to show you an extra feature here. So the world biomes are set up here by the World Wildlife Fund. So there's more information about um, the biomes here in this more info link. I would encourage you to have a look at that because it gives you quite a lot more detail about the biomes themselves. The key thing here is this little button at the top. It says click on the map for more information. So if I select this button and then I click on any one of these um, biome regions, it will highlight the area that I've clicked on and it will give me information about each biome. So in here, there are so the point I've clicked on is obviously on the boundary between two of them. So it's given me both. And you can switch between the two to, to work out how different they are. And if I change space, 
I get another biome. So there's obviously three of them here. And though sometimes they might all be the same, but sometimes they'll be different. If we zoom in a little bit, we get some different ones here. And then you can see the sorts of area it covers. Um, again, lots of capacity for thinking about what, um, what the biomes tell us about the place, what the place tells us about the biomes, and so on. Let me turn that button off and that will reactivate the, um, the overlays on the left. We've also got mountain ranges here and we have volcanoes. Amazing to see how widespread volcanic activity is. Um, so you could perhaps look at one particular patch of volcanoes and you could use your annotation tools to label them, for example. Maybe you could set up a quiz saying this is volcano one, what's its name, um, how high it is, something like that. Go back to the overlays. Turn the volcanoes off and mountain ranges off. We also have the tectonic plates. And in case you didn't want them colored in, we have the tectonic plate boundaries as well on their own. So you can see more of the underlying map. That's quite useful. Uh, and lastly, on the overlays list, we have a set of reference grids. So there's a latitude and longitude grid there. And also, once you zoom into the UK, you get the British National Grid as well. Put that one on. And that's, we've seen that one before. So the overlays are lots and lots of interesting stuff to explore. Um, do have a look at the learning resources because they involve lots of the, um, lots of the overlays as well. Um, I have talked about the measurement tools already, just to recap, distance is done by just clicking a line, double click to get the end result, it gives you the end result and tooltip, and also in the left hand panel, area is done the same way, draw your shape, double click to close it, and it will give you the area of the shape you've drawn there, and in both metric and imperial measurements on the left hand side. Um, if you want to add your own data, there are instructions, I don't think I've got time to go through this in detail here and now, there are instructions in our help pages to how to create um, a, a point file to upload to, to, um, to your map. So if you had a series of postcodes, say, and you wanted to plot them all on a map, you could do it that way to create your simple um, a text file with your postcodes in it, and it will appear as a series of markers on the map. Um, I do want to show you this image search, though, because I think this is be quite useful. Let me just remove all this area measurements and let's move all my uh, drawings as well, just save confusion. So if I want to pick a particular area, let's pick uh, somewhere in the Lake District, just for an example. And if I wanted to search this particular area for images of mountains, I type mountains in here and it will give me a series of images here. On the map, you will see little uh, camera icons. If you click on a camera icon, it will give you a copy of the map of, of the photograph it's taken. Click on the photograph in the thumbnail, and you can see the full image there. So these images come from um, a, something called Geograph, which you may or may not know about. Um, the tagging in them is sometimes um, maybe not what one might expect. Um, we don't have much control over that but it's, it often comes up with some very useful things. Um, if you wanted to search for any photographs in a particular area, the, the uh, simplest way is to put in a star in the search box, and then that will show you all the photographs that are available in that particular area on your map. And then as you zoom in, you'll see that the green circles will become little camera icons to show you um, where their photographs are actually taken. So lots to explore there too. Um, I think that's everything I want to cover just now. Have we got any more questions, Laura? Yes, Emma, um, there is a question. Um, can you show us how to use six figure grid reference, please? Okay. So there are two ways to find a six figure grid reference. The first is to look in the map information panel here. So on the left hand side, the six figure grid references here will follow your cursor. So if you want to capture the grid reference to a particular point, slide this capture coordinate capture box 
that button here and then click on the map where you want to identify your location. That will fix this stuff here so that it doesn't move with your cursor and you can then copy it like this and paste it into something else. That's one option. The other option is under the drawing tools here where you can use the grid reference button. Click on this one here and then click on the map. Let's find something to measure uh, this little house here. That will give me a grid reference. The grid reference is set according to the scale of the map. So the more zoomed in your map, the more detailed the grid reference. So as you zoom out, the grid reference will stay the same, but you can draw another one uh, when, you, when you activate the button, duh, um, like this, and that will give you a different grid reference. Zoom out again and do the same again, grid reference button, Check grid reference, and you see that grid references again is, is less accurate according to the scale of the map you're looking at. Does that answer the question, or have I confused you? So on on that note, we've got a question from Anna. Can you search the grid reference? Search for grid reference. Yes, let's try and search for NY thirty eight sixteen. There you go. Yes, you can search your grid reference in. In the search box at the top and it will come up with that there now that will come up with the bottom left hand corner of the grid square that is referenced by that that grid reference yeah. is that okay yeah thank you we've got um another question is it possible to have a four figure grid reference and then have the grid overlay to help students turn it into a more accurate six figure grid Yep, here we are. Let's, well, let's use that one that we've got there. So once you've, you've located your, your basic grid reference, if you then go to, let's say what, let's put a marker from the grid reference marker here, like that. If we then go to the overlays and we add the reference grids here, British National Grid. So once you zoom in on your point, you'll find that the grid reference sorry, the, the, the grid overlay changes according to the scale of the map. So in that sense, you can help students to understand that there is the, the larger square. And as they zoom in, they get the smaller squares and zoom in again. And I think it only goes up as, as that, that far, I think. And it goes in, in that far. But yes, there is your grid and you can help them to understand how it gets broken down to create grid references of different levels. Of course, you can, of course, get them to draw their own on top and then compare it with, with what they get within Digimap for Schools as well, if that's, if that's useful. Oh, thank you. And we've got another question from Sophia. Um, is there a maximum number of children who can look, sorry, who can be locked in at any one time? In theory, no. Um, we haven't sat down 4,000 children in one room and tried to lock them in all at once, but it should take a whole class of children at the same time. Well, thank you. Okay, if there's anything anybody wants me to recap, then I'm happy to go over some things again, if that's useful. If, if not, um, I will just show you the uh, help functions and the learning resources, if that's useful. Um, so in the bottom, sorry, top right hand corner here is a little downward arrow, and this will give you a link to the help pages. If I open the help pages now, there are lots and lots of how to guides. These are split up into very small sections. So how to um, identify the different areas of, the, of the, the interface, how to view map keys. They're split up into very small things, how to add text, how to add markers with lots of step by step instructions. Um, we do have lots of YouTube videos too, so there are webinars like this also repeated on our YouTube channel. Um, definitely worth exploring the help because we hope we split it up into very small sections that are easy to digest and easy to read and, and understand quite quickly. If you're looking for learning resources at the top of our, our website, so before you log in, there's a link here to help and resources and the learning resources are listed under here. So there are lots and lots of different 
uh, things there covering a whole range of topics. If we say take primary ideas, for example, these are then um, can be filtered according to a category, primary ideas, locational knowledge, and you can select your stage in ages. Um, it's done in ages rather than key stage one, key stage two, because of course the key stage one, key stage two thing is different between England and Scotland. Um, so trying not to disenfranchise anybody by putting it down as a sort of age bracket rather than um, a particular type to a particular curriculum. Um, you can select a subject, so let's say choose physical geography and let's leave that one. Now, what have I done? I've narrowed it down too much, that's all. Um, so we can have a look at some of these. Why use aerial imagery? This is a useful, a useful one. So every resource comes with a PDF, with, which gives you um, things to follow with, within the class. So there's some background for the teacher and also some, some activities for children to do as well. Lots and lots to explore there. And if anybody wants to um, suggest other resources, we're very happy to, to hear about suggestions too. Uh, Emma, we've got a couple of questions, one from Karen, and she's asking, can you copy maps to paste onto activity sheets? Uh, yes, so probably the best thing to do here is, I just, I just realised I didn't show you the printing. So the printing button is up here at the top of the screen. So if we hit the print button, what you will get here is a, a, an idea of the content of your map, but also the second tab here will give you an idea of the layout. So you can change between portrait and landscape, and then you can drag your map around underneath there so that it fits within the box. The blue box will tell you the area that your map will print. The content preview will tell you what the content of the map will look like. You can add a title. You can add your name if you want. You don't have to, but you can. You can set the print scale to be either exactly what it is um, on the screen, or you can round it to a nice round figure. You can also select the print format. So we do these in PDF, which are really good for just printing off and, and copying. Um, or if you wanted an image, you could have a JPEG image and that will allow you to just copy it and paste it and drop it into PowerPoint, into Word or whatever it is that suits you. I'm going to generate this now so you can, oh, I've done it wrong, sorry, I should have done the PDF. Um, so you can see what they look like. All the maps come with, let's see if this will work with my, Computer. I've just had to have my computer reset with all sorts of things because um, it, I changed my password and it didn't like it. Um, now, can, I don't know if you can see this. No, you can't because I'm not showing that screen. Sorry, let's try this again. I'm going to print it in PDF. The PDF and the, the JPEG versions will look exactly the same. It's just the format that's different. So here I'm going to print the PDF version. And it should open, doesn't open, hang on a second. I'm going to see if I can switch my screen share. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute and share a different screen so that you can see um, what it looks like. Right, just a second. Screen share, this one. There, can you all see a, a map, yes? I'm hoping that's okay, right. So I'm gonna zoom in on this a little bit. I've got a little screen here, so it's quite hard to, to show you everything. Um, yeah, I can see it. All at once there. So as you can see at the bottom, um, it will have your name and the date and um, your school name as well. It includes a north arrow and the scale bar. It will give you some information about the projection um, and it also includes the um, cardinal scale there as well. So I haven't lined this map up very well. I, I, didn't, I didn't check it before I hit the print button. Because it's just a, a file, you can print as many of these as you like and you can fiddle around with them until you get them exactly where you want. Um, it's, it's, there's no, no limit on how many times you can hit the print button and produce something. Whether you send it to your printer or not, of course, is, is up to you. Um, but if you just want the electronic copy, then you can do this and then copy and paste it, put it into Word documents and so on. Let me just switch screens again. Get the right screen. This one. There. Does that answer the question, you think, Laura? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we've got a question from Charlotte here. Uh, do you provide specific training for individual schools? Um, 
that's not necessarily sustainable for us. But if you have a particular need, we have a colleague at Audience Survey who travels around doing twilight sessions for schools in, in an area. So if you've got a few uh, schools close to you and you can get enough people in a room together to do that, then we can run, uh, Darren can run tri twilight sessions like that. If that's something you're interested in, then drop us an email and we can um, have a conversation about it. Emma. Okay. Is there anything anybody wants me to recap before we finish? No. Okay. questions as a result of this or questions about Digimap schools at any time, drop us an email. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, um, uh, we will sorry. Send you a recording. Emma, is it, would it be possible to do a quick recap of the overlays? Yes, of course. Yeah. Thank you. So the overlays panel is here on the left hand side. Let me just move my screen around a bit. Um, the overlays are split into groups here. So the GB overlays is the one I'm looking at a GB map here. So it's the easy one to do is to add them here. So you expand the boxes here and check, check the box for the overlay that you want and it will appear. It will stay in place as you zoom in and out. But for some of them at some point, the overlay will disappear because it doesn't become appropriate at the scale of the map that you're looking at. But you can expand the um, information about the overlays here. So if we go out to a world view here, you'll see that the British National Grid overlay gets switched off automatically because it would be so tiny on this map, it would just be a bit of blurry blue lines. But at this scale, of course, we've got um, global overlays. So things like the world population density, you can add this here and you can change the transparency of it. So if you use the slider under the, um, under the uh, overlay name, you can make it more or less obvious. This is a global overlay, so as I zoom in, of course, it will eventually um, not, uh, not be appropriate for that particular map. But once you get a bit closer, you can then start to see the details of the underlying map by using the transparency slider a bit, a bit better. Um, worth exploring all these. There are reference grids at the bottom that are um, global, so the latitude and longitude and the major lines of latitude, so tropics of Capricorn and Cancer and the equator. Um, we've also got world physical geography, which includes the biomes and mountain ranges, volcanoes, tectonic plates, and just the tectonic plate boundaries. So the tectonic plates are colored in and the tectonic plate boundaries are just the lines. To recap on the world biomes, which is very useful. Um, again, this has the transparency slider on it, so you can fade between the underlying map and the biomes. This little information button at the top of the map will allow you to interrogate the different biomes on the map here to learn a bit more about them. There is also, let's close that, switch that button off, a link to more information in the left-hand panel here. That's a quick guide, and it also links to the guide that the WWF produced, which is very, very detailed, um, but worth it if you really want to know a lot about how they came up with the different categorizations. Does that cover everything? Uh, yeah, we we'll just have a quick question on, on that. So just a quick comment. Yes, the, the video will be shared uh, on our YouTube channel a few days after the event. Um, we will be emailing, sorry, we will email you the, the link um, a few days after the event. We've got a quick question. Uh, does the library of overlays have things like deforestation, pollution, etc.? Um, no, the, the extent of the overlays is exactly what you see here. So there are possibilities for adding more overlays. It's just a question of what's most useful and how we add them without making the interface so complicated that they become unusable. Cool, thank you. But yes, there's lots, there's lots to explore. Um, that, uh, I suppose my, my parting shot would be have a go. You can't break it. You might get in a muddle, but you can't break it. You can't do anything wrong. So click on everything and try it. 
and, and see, see how you get on. If all else goes horribly wrong, shut your browser and start again. It's really, um, that, that's your kind of that reset button, if you like, if, if you really get in a muddle. But you can't, you can't break it, so keep trying and have a play with it. You'll learn much more just by fiddling with things, trying things out, and working out um, what each button does. And just a quick question as well, where are good resources for adding our own overlays into this system? Um, so adding your own data is, is um, a process that's best done with a set of instructions. So if you go to the help pages, there is a set of instructions here on adding your own data, so help, and this will tell you exactly what file formats you can create and how to do it. And there are pictures, and I think there's also a video on the YouTube channel that will cover that as well. Okay. Yeah. All good? Yep. Thank you very much. Super. Thank you so much. As I said, if you've got any questions anytime, email us. We will get back to you as soon as we can. I'm very conscious it's difficult for everybody to think of questions right here, right now, when you sort of put on the spot. Um, difficult for us to anticipate all the questions as well. Um, so really, we are here to help you if you get stuck. Um, if anybody has another two or three minutes to hang on, um, we have a couple of questions we'd like to ask about um, the sorts of resources we provide. So it, if you haven't time now, thank you very much for coming. Um, I hope it's been useful for you. If you do have another couple of minutes to hang on, um, I might um, open microphones and we could have a wee conversation about, um, about uh, the sorts of things that we provide and what else you'd like to see. <laughs>